Okay, Tina Kotoka Tour, everybody. More than that. All right, as we wait for um, the two on our left to um, quieten down. All right, welcome to our activities um, update meeting this morning. While it's not minuted, um, we still need to acknowledge um, a couple of absences that we have. Um, we also have Councillor Brent Coles that's uh, joining us online and also Gary, Mayor Gary Kutcher that's um, away uh, today as well. Um, but warm welcome to everybody and thank you for um, coming in and for all the staff's work um, putting these reports together. Um, so if we can just make a start and just get cracking straight into it. I understand that these activity reports are more of an update to provide us with the information of where we're at and we will go department by department. Um, but I, um, I'm i expecting there will be some questions that um, our governance team will be asking. And I'm also um, quite mindful of the time that we have to be able to cover everything. So we might try and cover things um, department by department and then we'll ask for questions um, from there. Okay, I will hand that over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, for the sake of time, Minister will take the report as read and hand straight over to questions. Okay, any questions? Uh, Councillor Thank Hoddy? you. Thank you, Mia Hanna uh, Josh, I'm just wondering on the um, Rock Armouring Project on the Rory Breakwater, so the 624 tonnes, what was the total tonne placement on their original project? Uh, unfortunately, Grant's Roads isn't here today, and he'd be able to answer that specifically. Um, I believe it was well over 1,800 tonnes, but I'd have to confirm that. A supplementary question on that. Is, is that um, loss of rock to the to the sea um, in 12 months, is that greater than usual or about what happens normally? I mean, do we get, because that's about a third of what we've put there based on what you've just told us. Yeah, um, no, that's actually quite um, a small amount. Sorry, I may have misspoke. We, we, we did place several thousand tonnes of rock. Um, that, that's quite a small amount that we generally lose. We generally lose a lot more than that. So it performed incredibly well under the, under the conditions. Um, from from the, the previous discussion, there's some comment made about that the area requiring most input was relating to historical smaller top size material. So are you able to confirm if this replacement is related predominantly to that or is it the, the whole the whole area? Uh, that replacement is across the whole of, of the breakwater structure. Some of it is some of the smaller rock. The large rock that we have placed recently performed far better than what the smaller rock historically that's been there has um, performed. Uh, so it is across the entire breakwater structure. It isn't just small sections, um, but we we have concentrated our efforts into certain areas in the, the previous lot of work, um, but we've lost a bit across a few sections. All right. Councillor Hopkins? Yeah, a couple of other questions. Um, just uh, one, the first of them on Alps to Ocean on the next page, page seven of our report. Um, I'd, I'd like a bit more information about the state of the A2O trial from Dunturin to Omru and, um, and the, you know, the time frame for upgrading or improving, especially if it's poor now. And I would just note for the benefit of um, everyone, including people in Wellington, that Linz is busy looking, reviewing, that you tell us in a paragraph that they're reviewing easement agreements and they're actually monetizing everything. So if it's good enough for government departments to charge 
for everything associated with Alps to Ocean, then we should be able to charge for people to actually use it rather than have our rate pay us for all the bills. So I just make that as a comment. And, I, and it, 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 everyone else seems to be willing to monetize. And I think we really need to push harder to actually move the cost from residents and ratepayers to users. But um, a bit more about the Ops Ocean Trail to Dunfrew. And also, just if I can ask the other question now, um, on page nine, um, it, you mentioned Dunfrew and toilets and road improvements. Um, I wonder if we can get a report at some point about the uh, contentious yellow lines. I know I've spoken to you, and you tell me that um, we have to have these yellow lines at the intersection by the vanished world. Um, what fascinates me about that is why they aren't at all sorts of other intersections around the district. And since they weren't there for decades and no one apparently was perturbed, um, I wonder if we can get a report at some point from Roding, since apparently we can determine whether we want them or not. So it would be nice if the matter could come to council at some point, please. Yep, uh, I'll handle your first question there regarding the obstruction, its condition from Duntru to Omaru. Uh, as the report states, it is in a fairly poor condition. Uh, we have had people that have inspected that section a number of times. Um, they've ridden it themselves and they didn't have to come off their bike at all which was fantastic um so it is possible for an experienced rider however it is in an incredibly poor condition uh we are currently out for tender for repair works at the moment that area will be prioritized for those repair works uh, we are working with the landowners there to try to get that work uh, fixed as soon as possible um, but it has been quite some time obviously since the rain events in July last year for us to be able to have the funding to go ahead and undertake the repair works, which has been frustrating for a great number of people. Um, with respect to the yellow lines in Duntroon or the, the no parking section, yes, um, we, we can bring a report if that's something that we'd like to be considered by council. It is um, an aspect of safety improvements. Whenever we're doing up an intersection, we do try to indicate where people should and shouldn't park for safety reasons. The reason it would have been left alone for several decades is because no work can be done at that intersection. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Councillor Blackler. Thank you. Um, I just, uh, page uh, nine, with respect to the, um, the other aspect of the breakwater, regarding the access um the the um, activity update indicates you know some form of barrier would be necessary but th there's a um a, re a consultant's report um by wsp to council um sometime around 2020 or 21 that um is kind of counter to the approach well it's not counter it's um it's taking the extreme end of the, the report recommendations which actually state that it wouldn't be practicable to um to go down that path and it suggests some other alternative approaches i just wonder if you could comment on that wsp report um if you if you're aware of it or um uh yeah with respect to that report um there are practicalities concerning actually fencing it and putting in um, some form of barrier. Obviously, we do need access to that area um, with construction equipment to continue maintaining the breakwater. So whatever we put in place would have to actually be removable and people could hop off and climb on it and climb over it anyway, um, which is of some concern. The health and safety implications, as well as the implications on wildlife without a barrier in place, um, is something that we don't believe would achieve resource consent from the Target Regional Council and certainly wouldn't receive support from Department of Conservation. Uh, so we're trying to, to tread a line, I suppose, between the, 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 the parties and what they're wanting us to have um, as well as trying to maintain access. Obviously, that's going to come at some level of cost, which of, is of concern. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm interested to note that in that report, that there was no mention of um, the building code being a, a relevant aspect. And, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm not... I'm not a legal expert, so uh, and there's people far more qualified than myself, but I, I can't find anywhere in the in the building code that is relevant to the 
the breakwater and the, and the WSP report kind of supports that. Um, and, it, and it states that um, due to the nature of the area, um, we we kind of, we should be taking a, a responsible approach, but we're not obligated uh, under the Health and Safety at Work Act. Uh, with respect to the application of the building code, I'd, I'd need to defer to our building department. Uh, it was my understanding that given it was a man-made structure, uh, it would apply. However, I'm happy to be corrected on that. Um, and with respect to the Health and Safety Work Act, no, you're correct. That doesn't apply because it isn't a workplace. It, it only applies when we're actually undertaking work at that site. I think it's also important to um, be mindful of our duty of care. Um, as well with with that um, instance. Yeah, so I'm not suggesting that we don't have a responsibility at all, but I'm just questioning whether the suggested pathway is um, perhaps too too far. Thank you for that. Um, Yes, Brent. Sorry, I can't see because there's something on that on the screen. Uh, good morning. Um, well, just a quick question there. I see that on page eight, um, it's showing that we've had a busy holiday season. I'm just wondering um, around the camping. Do we have any comparison to other years, or do we? Is that a report that we get to look at throughout the year to see uh, how that's performed against other years around the camp sites and uh, up the up the valley? Uh, I don't have that information to hand, but generally at the end of a season, we do bring a report to council for council to consider and understand uh, a comparison year by year. Thank you. Thanks for that, Brent. Uh, yes, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and through you. Um, the Bushy Beach crack, um, more to the... Um, extra, extra information that Mr. Vanderspeck uh, emailed to us prior. I, I just wonder, on reflection now, was our process a wee bit flawed there in terms of um, hoping that we were going to get an outcome that hasn't happened, and so now we've had to back the bus up a bit? Well. <clears throat> Yes and no. <laughs> Obviously, we were hoping for a more ideal outcome. We were hoping for some more um, interagency support for the project, which hasn't eventuated. There is an external party that is against allowing us to use some of their land, um, as well as against increasing visitor numbers in that area, um, which is challenging for us in trying to have the project actually completed. Um, but we're, we're continuing to work through it and we'll try to get the best possible outcome we can for the money that we have. Thank you for that. Oh. Any other questions? I'll take Councillor Hopkins. Oh, sorry. I thought, I, was, I thought we might have finished, so I was going to move on to roading, but, um, but maybe Tim has another question. Um, to the Bushy Beach query, um, I was just wondering what uh, if you could um, discuss like the focus that we've that we've had to date, or or um, seeking to undertake around the ecological impact on. The, by having increased traffic around um, that area and the impact that could have on the um, yellow-eyed penguins. And on up the road. <laughs> uh, this is probably an area for um, people far more intelligent than I am, <laughs> uh, that, that, are, that are, I suppose, experts in the field of, of ecology. Um, but my understanding is um, an external agency is concerned about additional visitor numbers to the beach um, and around the headland and what that may mean on the populations, whether it's just them being visible or whether it's an increased um, possibility of people heading down to the beach while penguins are coming in. Um, I'm not 100% sure on what the basis of their concern is, but they've undertaken a number of studies and are going through a management program at the moment to understand what implications they'll allow and not allow for Hoi Ho. 
Yeah, thanks. So I, I think the concern is that there would be an increase of likelihood with people with dogs and therefore because they're in the proximity, they would head down and then, um, you know, more unintended or unfortunate events would be likely to occur. And I, I think I'm kind of supportive of the risks there given the, um, you know, the situation that the yellow light is in. We, we, we need to have some steps in place to... Uh, to get that balance right, I, I, I think. Yeah, Councillor Blackwood makes a, a valid point. Um, if there are any additional information in terms of looking at how to manage um, that risk, it would be good to take that into consideration. Um, moving on, did you have a question in relation to that, um, Councillor McCoke? Uh, just regarding the Omri Public Gardens, just a wee bit of extension on that of what we're actually looking at there and, and, and the cost, please. Oh, yeah, we're at the bottom of page nine. Sorry, this, this is with respect to the ponds? Yeah. Yep. Um, so the, the ponds have obviously filled up over time with uh, silt and sediment. Uh, what we're looking at doing there is removing that silt and sediment. We've gone out to tender previously to try to remove it uh, through use of a dredge into um, filter bags, similar to what we have done recently for our wastewater ponds. Uh, that came back as prohibitively expensive. We're looking at alternative options at the moment, whether that's using um, some kind of a bacteria that'll eat the sludge down or all of the, the nutrients that are in it, or whether it's just getting in with a a truck and um, and an excavator and trying to hollow some areas out as well. Um, the, the team are working on it. There's a number of different options. All of the options don't really meet our current budget requirements, um, but we're trying to meet it as best we can. Thank you. We'll move on to Rodin. Page 10. Look, a question for me, um, um, through you, obviously, um, on page 10, um, the team has completed the interim speed management plan required by central government and a consultation process is underway accordingly. The interim plan will cover the first stage of the safe speeds around schools program. The government's told us we have to do it, and they've told us what the speed should be at our let's say. What, what is there to consult upon? I mean, don't we simply tell people we've been told to do this once again by Wellington, and so we're doing it. I'm just curious as to what on earth we expect to get by way of feedback and how we can amend a parliamentary directive. Uh the consultation that we have is around the placement of those signs, what what areas should be restricted in speed. Obviously, we've got minimum sized areas around a school. However, we may be able to extend those if people want, would like us to, or if there's frequent travel routes for school children that they prefer to be slower speeds as well. So the consultation is really focusing on where the placement of signs should be and where those speed signs should actually be in relation to schools. So supplementary then, if the, regular, if the parliamentary dictate was to have speed limits around schools, then that's clearly geographically defined and confined. If somebody says, oh, we think a particular road, let's say Thames Highway, should be speed controlled because children use it as an access route to a number of schools, it, it may not be close to a school at all, but are you suggesting, well, we couldn't do it there because it's a state highway anyway, but are you suggesting that we might actually extend the, the speed limits to areas quite geographically distant from schools? Uh, I, I wouldn't say geographically distant, no. I'd say where there's several schools close to one another and the boundaries may have, you know, a 30 zone to a 50 zone to a 30 zone to a 50 zone to a 30 zone. It would be instead of having that change in speed, for a short distance between the schools, we might just have that entire section as a 30 zone. If you take the uh, Reed Street, for example, where there's a number of schools along that area, um, 
we, we may just choose to, to take a section of Reed Street and turn that as a 30 kilometre zone rather than as a 50 zone in, in sections between the schools. Thank you for that. Um, probably just a question uh, in regards to the asset management team preparing documentation for the National Land Transport Plan. Is there an opportunity for the governance team to be able to feed into that? I'm mindful that we did have a workshop back in February and there were some strategic priorities there that we thought that we might be able to have input into. Is that something that's possible? Uh, yes, uh, planning to have a number of workshops with elected members prior to submission of that NLTP, just trying to form a basis at the moment, come up with a draft so that there's something we can provide comment on. Great, thank you for that. Any other questions, Councillor McKay? Yes, sorry, Josh. Um, just on, under operations on page 10 about Whitestone contracting, it says inspections of the network are progressing with a complete network, all folks inspection expected in April. Um, what does that actually mean? Uh, an all faults inspection is a detailed inspection of the road network, um, which ensures that we capture all of the defects that might be in the road so that we can prioritise the work accordingly. So it's quite a detailed inspection process. Um, it means we pick up where all, all the potholes are, where there's there's not enough um, travel width or too much travel width or, or whatever it might be, or there's vegetation issues or there's not enough signposting or any, all those kinds of things. All those kinds of things are considered in all faults. So it's not just looking for one particular thing. It's not just looking at the lane itself. It's looking at all of the road um, and then coming up with the defects list from there. Just supplementary to that one, Josh. Um, when we're taking on those sort of projects and roading, are we looking at do we take into account all our infrastructure in that area condition of before we proceed with any other work? Um, with respect to capital projects, you mean? So renewals, yeah. Um, we do look at, or we do try to work into departmentally um, with obviously waters. Um, who pr provide the majority of utility networks within our, our roads. Uh, we do work with other agencies, the likes of Network Waitaki and Chorus, um, to look at what needs they might have before we go and re rehabilitate a road. Um, where we can, um, we do try to seek that assets be renewed if they're close to useful life so that we don't need to then go ahead and dig a road up again to, to repair or replace an asset. Um, it doesn't always align with, with other priorities. Um, but we do make an effort to, yes. <coughs> Any other questions on this page? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, I notice uh, we're talking about um, our temporary traffic management delivery. Um, I, I know that... Um, Health and safety is an inordinate cost in anything that we do. Um, but one of the current projects on the, the southern entrance to um, Western, we have two contractors working on that section of road. The road is closed, as I understand, to all but local residents, and yet we have two separate sets of traffic management staff there because of the two contractors. So in essence, we're paying twice. Um, is that an area that we can have some uh, more input in and maybe reduce our costs? Uh, I'd, I'd need to look further to the specifics of those contracts in order to, to provide a comment to you. Um, however, it's my understanding that those contracts, we're actually engaging the traffic management companies ourselves rather than the contractors are. So it's not as though we're paying the contractors to then pay traffic management companies. We've engaged the, con the traffic management companies. Um, so we would only be paying what we feel is absolutely necessary to obviously maintain those sites in a site in a safe condition. That That is the thing that we've changed in approach recently where we are engaging the traffic management companies ourselves rather than the contractors doing so. Um, and that's been done pretty 
primarily because of the escalating costs. It was seen as a way that we could potentially manage some of those costs ourselves in us um, having a competitive process around traffic management companies rather than just having the contractor choose either themselves or someone that they'd like to use traditionally. Yeah. Uh, we have Councillor Coles uh, online with a question. Yeah, look, thanks. Um, Josh, just a little bit further, I guess, to the, when the roads are being inspected, um, you know, I, I guess part of the reason that, that I'm, I've remained in Oda today is, is the rain and we've got pooling in some quite sort of heavy areas and stuff. When those roads are inspected, how do, how do we sort of predict where water's going to be running or where those issues may be? Um, and I, I just would like to also note and, and thank Roading for coming through and, and actually uh, uh, last week responding very quickly to some of those issues. But I guess that's just one of my things that, that you know, I wonder uh, if it's not raining and these are done in the dry when we see uh, some quite severe areas of pulling around certain, certain roads, um, how's that catered for, please? Um, the travel of water on roads is, I suppose, a separate process from what an all faults inspection would be. Um, we do look at when we're designing roads, um, which way the water is likely to travel and what we need as far as infrastructure to be able to capture that water and, and convey it away. Um, we don't generally have a tendency to go back and look at what's, what's there um, because it, it's worked for some time. Obviously, we need to change that approach given recent events. Yeah, and I guess um, just supplementary to that, um, you know, we I'm not sure whether it's through the process of us having had fibre put in or some of the stuff, you know, we're seeing, I guess, particularly I'm talking about here in Otamatata, but um, we're finding a sort of water pooling in places that it hasn't before. So um, I guess that's something that maybe we have a discussion uh, at some point. But, um, yeah, I was just, just uh, you know, an interest to find out how that is, uh, how that is looked at or how that's maintained. Thank you for that, um, Councillor Coles. It's probably something that's top of mind, uh, especially with our um, increase in weather events and needing to do some active work programming around that space if possible please all right moving on are we okay councillor hopkins um, yeah look sorry one other one other question josh um uh, under operations there's a reference to the um trial you've been doing in corridale with mowing of some ro road shoulders mixed with chemical treatments and you're going you tell us that this will be assessed for effectiveness and cost any interim conclusions yet? I mean, is there any anything that might point to a to this being an effective or ineffective way to deal with with uh, verges? Uh, sorry, I don't have the detail to hand, and our roading manager isn't present today, um, so I can't really provide comment on that. Thank you. We're we moving on to the waters. Yes. Uh, look, a couple of questions. Um, the first one, I, I'm just, you talk about the very first paragraph tells us about the water samples not arriving at the lab in Christchurch because of delays in the courier service. Well, there's more than one courier and more than one means, I would have thought, to get um, samples to Christchurch. Surely this can be sorted. Um, the second question I have or is um, on the same page. And it's probably really a matter of public information. You talk about the Mahino water supply and you say how we're going to need to manage the existing intake and pump shed for a short period of time while the connection to the Hamnack pipeline is constructed following adoption of the annual plan. So everyone, it, do you think we've made it clear enough to people that that Mahino has been an outlier and is now going to join a single unified system that runs all the way down from, from Omaru right down to, to, um, to Hamden. Through Madam Chair, um, the first question around the sampling, uh, we've been battling with this for several years. We had a dedicated 
a truck which used to transport um, samples to the lab in Dunedin, and then that got stopped. We've tried multiple couriers, and they don't guarantee 24-hour delivery. So our samples have to be there at the lab within 24 hours. Um, so it's just something we've been battling with, and I just want, wanted to highlight it, that it's a reason for some of our um, non-compliance. <laughs> Funnily enough, we've talked about um, staff delivering it to uh, the lab in Dunedin. Um, we have staff members who drive as far as Palmerston now or live in Palmerston, so it is something we are actively considering. And regard, yep. So just a clarification, I got the impression from your answer just now that we were use, having a lab test of them in Dunedin and for some reason we had to stop doing that and use one in Christchurch instead, but you seem to be indicating we could go back to Dunedin if we, if, if we had a, a transport guarantee. Uh, yeah, through the through the chair, the uh, lab in Dunedin used to supply us with the truck to uh, take the samples, and then they stopped delivering, stopped using that service. So then we changed to um, a lab in Christchurch. So, yeah. And so, the sorry, the second question about Mahino, we are um, just kicking off the consultation uh, regarding connecting up the Mahino community to. Uh, the Omri water supply, and as part of the annual plan process, that would be one of the items that is highlighted. From extra question, if I may, Madam Chair, have, has, have you done any calculations as to the individual cost of the connection if it was amortised across the entire um, uh, user network or user um, base for, for that now unified water supply? In other words, um, you're talking about how we're going to have to have a connection and it how it's set. Um, presumably, the moment the people in Mahino are connected, they'll essentially be paying a water rate identical to the one that everyone else is paying within the system. But the connection costs, what would they be if they were assigned to, ev to everyone within the system, within the network now? Uh, through Madam Chair. Uh, well, we haven't actually done that calculation at the moment. Uh, I can use an example, though, of when we looked to connect Kakanui up. It was less than ten dollars um, increase in the Omri rate, so I would have thought it would be maybe half of that, given the size of the community. Uh, yes, Councillor McCain. Yeah, thanks, Councillor McCain. Um, I'd rather start that request for water, and it says you. Um, will be advising or have advised consumers they'll need to pay for extra loads of water themselves or can consider an increase in the water allocation. Have we ensured that there's no leaks on the uh, on our side of the delivery line to the restrictors and that those restrictors on that whole line are delivering what they're supposed to before we charge these people? Uh, through Madam Chair, um, the delivery of tanks of water uh, to meet our requirements for how many units of water that they're um, effectively pay for. Uh, what we've found is that in some circumstances they're using more than the allocation when we deliver it to them. So if if they need that extra water on top of what we're contracted to supply, then um, we would look to um, them paying for it effectively above their allocation. I suppose what I'm asking is our own systems are sound though before we actually do that system, whether they're using it or not, the, the water prior to that system is, is running to everybody in a fair and equitable group of what they're paying for. Uh, yeah, through Madam Chair. Um, the, the reason that we're supplying them with water is because we've had leaks on our system and we haven't given them their allocation. So um, what we look to do is to repair the leaks, obviously, but in the meantime, make sure that they get their water they've paid for. Thank you. Any other questions on that page? Um, thank you for noting also the priority projects. It's helpful for us to um, to be aware of. I guess just on page um, 14 in terms of risks, um, that you'll follow this closely and consider an alternatives. Is there anything that you, any other information you think that we should be aware of? 
yeah, in response to your um, question there, we, we, what we've actually found, we, we thought we'd have some issues with um, pipe materials, um, but subsequent to writing this report, we've uh, secured um, materials that we needed also for treatment plants the same. Uh, so we, we will obviously keep an eye on this, but it, it's not as bad as we were initially thinking. Great, thank you. Okay, I think that might be it. No other questions for SH team? One more. So I just want um, this South Hill additional reservoir. Have we actually passed that? Has it come before council or before my time? Or someone explain this? Uh, through Madam Chair, that, that was part of the resilience uh, projects that we uh, put forward, accelerated uh, work program. Um, yes, yeah, so it was before your time. It's been agreed. I think it was about $3 million from memory. And so when it, when we are looking to award the contract, um, depending on the price, um, our chief executive has delegation up to $1.5 million. So depending on how much it comes back, we may come back to council with uh, confirmation for authority. Well, thank you. Okay, shall we move on to page 15, People and Transformation, IES Group Update. So welcome, um, Ms. Hill. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, in the interest of time, um, as with the previous report, we'll probably just go into questions. We do have some staff um, away today. So Francis, Pam, and Lisa are away, so um, I've got Jenny and Spot and Isabel and myself here, and we'll do our best to address what we can and otherwise take the respect to our co-workers for a response. Great, thank you. I think take it as read, and there is a whole heap of activities that, um, that you have been undertaking which are really, really positive. Uh, thank you for that. So we'll just jump straight to questions and we'll try and keep it snappy. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, uh, thank you. And, and a couple of questions uh, initially on the library. Um, on page 19, you talk about uh, the continued requests for skinny jump modems and requests for digital assistance. Uh, you go on to say that the engagement with the website's doubled. Um, can you just flesh that out a wee bit more? What, what for the sake of argument, are um, skinny jump modems and, and how are we meeting these requests for digital assistance? On the other question, actually, just to get rid of it at the same time, you talk about the Te Kakano program, or Te Kakano program. Um, how many people were, in, and you quote um, some people uh, commenting about how they, they enjoyed it on page 20. How many were involved in that program, please? Through the chair, Councillor Hopkins, um, to answer your first question, um, can you just restate what you what you were saying? Well, uh, it was just that you around skinny jump. Yeah, hey, well, hang on, let me just find it. Um, uh, the old machine's gone haywire now. <laughs> there was prior to Christmas, there were continued requests for skinny jump modems and requests for digital assistance. Audience engagements doubled, number of new users up by fifteen hundred or 40, uh, 1,400. And the pages most frequently viewed are bicultural events, followed by digital technology pages. So um, I was really just wondering uh, about the, you know, what are these skinny jump modems and why are people asking for them and, and what are the requests for digital assistance that you're getting, um, <clears throat> which, you, which are identified in the report? Okay, through the chair, Councillor Hopkins, thank you for the question. So skinny jump modems are a way of people accessing um, digital technologies um, in a, in a uh, re reduced kind of um, uh, charging frame, if you like, that's available through skinny jump. So people have access to modems at a, at a very low cost, for example, $5 per month. So it enables access of our um, population who 
meet certain criteria to actually be able to access the internet. So it's re it's about reducing that digital divide. So that's what Skinny Dump Modems are about. And through the libraries, Department of Internal Affairs assist us to be able to provide that program. So, so essentially, if you're poor, you can get one, provided you jump through certain department departmental hoops. And we hire these things out at a very modest monthly charge. Is that how it's working? No, we don't actually hire them out. So people, it's a it's a user pays. So Department of Internal Affairs actually are a provider of the program. So individuals have to pay if they meet the certain criteria that are set out by the Department of Internal Affairs. So we, as public libraries, we are actually administering that program and ensuring that our people across the district actually have access to digital technology. Is the department paying you to administer the, the, the program on their behalf? No, they are not. Do you think they should? Um, I'm through the chair. I'm unable to answer that question. Um, the skinny dump modems are available through all public libraries of New Zealand. Um, so it's a way of accessing people who come in, von in vulnerable communities who come in and see us. Thank you. I'm aware that that program is really beneficial for a lot of our uh, residents in Waitaki. So. Yeah. Um, I guess Councillor Hopkins' question is whether you know, there is some kind of subsidy that central government will be able to provide for our staff to be able to administer um, the service, but also, you know, notwithstanding the benefit that it actually has and something that we just need to weigh up in future. Um, also to add to um, your question, Councillor Hopkins, it's really important to realise that digital wellbeing is, is one of the uh, wellbeing requirements that our community actually has access to digital technology in order to assist their wellbeing um, because it's very difficult to access services without access to the internet now. Thank you for that. Has other question around the te kano classes and the te reo? Thank you for the reminder. Um, during this reporting period, I um, haven't got access to those numbers, but I can get them if you need them. Thank you for that. Any other questions for uh, Ms. B? Yes, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to drill down a little bit further, the skinny jump modem, it, does the skinny relate to the provider of the modems? Yes, that's correct because they used to be called the spark modems, spark jump modems. Thank you for that. Yes, Councillor Ryan. Thank you. Um, for the chair, I was just, oh, you might not have them, I was just curious around um, attendance for all of the um, programs and events that you've been running. There's a really impressive list of them. Are you happy with the attendance that you've been getting? We've been very happy with the attendance that we've been uh, getting. Although um, through the chair, it's been a mixed uh, a mixed few months, I have to say, with as waves of COVID come through, we've noticed that people are choosing to stay home. And then as people are becoming well again, they're coming back and attending our events. Great, thank you. No other questions? Great, thank you very much. All right, we'll move to uh, the Omaru Opera House. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Hopkins. Just, just a comment, really, um, but um, uh, Chloe may be able to amplify it a wee bit. Um, the, uh, the use of the Opera House numbers are encouraging. It looks, um, if we read on page 21, we've basically got about um, 1,400 um, extra people, nearly, nearly one, uh, 1,500. And certainly um, a creep up and well, a big big attendance jump in commercial use, although the bookings are only up from 73 to 76. So um, is that trend embedding? Does it look as though it's going to be in place for the remainder of the year? Uh, through the chair, my understanding from my conversations with Mrs. McHenney at the Opera House are, yes, the trend is looking positive, the forward bookings are looking good. So um, we anticipate that will continue. Thank you. Just a question from me. Um, I'm noticing that the community 
um, bookings are, are actually higher than the commercial. What's the difference with the community and the not-for-profit, please? Just on page 21. Um, I wish Francis was here right now to answer that. I believe it's the booking um, framework and the costs that are applied to it, and I believe um, there is a split out there in terms of whether I think the community ones are sort of ongoing mm -hmm. ones, but I would have to go back and clarify that, I'm afraid. But it just indicates that it has been utilised a lot more by community or community agencies and groups, which is a good thing. Absolutely. And um, Mrs McElhaney has been working along with the Opera House team to really drive that engagement. Great, thank you. Uh, moving on, any other questions about the Opera House before we move to the Forest of Gallery? And once, twice. Okay, museum. Yes. Um, Chloe, uh, uh, on page 26, we've got some graphs showing attendance numbers. Um, and uh, I was alarmed to see the numbers this year for the museum. Not only are they substantially lower, um, after a period when they've been, when the museum's been closed, um, but they are lesser in March than in February. And I'm wondering if you're concerned at all um, about the number of people going through the museum, because those are, those are not good numbers. Uh, through the chair, it may be my graph making skills that have let us down there, but the 2023 numbers are better than the 2022 numbers. They are a little lower than the 2021 numbers, but that was just when we'd opened the stage one redevelopment and we had a lot of local people through. We don't have any figures there yet for March. I expect the March figures will be looking very good now that we've opened the upstairs of the museum, so um, apologies for my graph skills. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my apologies for leaving to a negative conclusion. So what you're saying is the two yellow bars don't actually tell, represent the number of people who have been going into the museum. Um, no, the two yellow bars are this year, but I would just caution to be probably comparing them to 2022 rather than 2021, because 2021 was just on the back of opening that um, new space on the ground floor. And I would say going into March and April, I expect to see a similar lift in the yellow bar now that we've opened the new spaces upstairs. But, sorry, sorry, sorry. Wasn't 2022... Quite substantially affected by closures and the like. So, I mean, the blue numbers are so much lower because for a lot of the time, certainly in the first half of that year, the museum wasn't accessible for people. At least that's my recollection. So, I mean, I'm, yeah, okay. Uh, 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 through the through the chair, I think you have got that right. So I think if I'm understanding you correctly, you're feeling the 2021 and 2023 are the best comparison, and we should just. Uh, disregard 2022 due to the impact of building work in COVID? Oh, yes, possibly so, yes. Mm. So it sounds like there's exceptions to those. To that. Statistics are always uh, interesting what we can do with the graphing of them, but overall I'm anticipating that number to lift and certainly as we get through the year and into our school programs and having temporary exhibitions in again. So I'm not unduly concerned. Thank you, thank, thank you for that. Yeah. Councillor Percival, you have a question? Yeah, Chloe, regardless of your computer skills, I think you're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> it's lovely feedback. Thank you. For Thank that. you, Councillor Percival, and I'll pass that on to the team because it's certainly not just myself, but our lovely team and volunteers as well. Thank you for that. So just moving through, great to see the opening of the new exhibition spaces. Mm -hmm. um, very well done to the team. And good to see the governance update there. Thank you. Um, IT and information management. Sorry, governance advisor, did you have anything to include? Oh, no, I'm happy to answer questions with anything I've got. There's uh, quite a substantive work, lot of work going on at the moment to move the processes and documents that have gone through induction and move them up onto the website and through into the transformation program where they'll be aligned with the decision and prioritisation framework. So any questions, happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seems like they're all very satisfied. All right, information technology. Thank you very much for that, uh, Michelle. 
Yes, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, um, Scott, just on cyber security at the bottom of page 29, you talk about 157 security alerts resulting in 21 incidents. Um, I, if you can amplify that a wee bit, I'd be, appreciate it. Um, and also the next sentence, out of this one incident proved to be of concern and resulted in a password reset on the user's account. Can you give us a bit more information about that as well, please, and what the implications were and why you were concerned? Through the chair. Um, so the 157 alerts are based on thousands and thousands of pieces of data we've got coming in. Um, so some of those show up as non anomalies. Um, so we have to, um, the system that we provide these alerts through filters those out. So out of those 157 anomalies, 21 were instances so that needed investigated. Um, so as it says here, um, the one that was of concern was a staff member had entered a phishing um, credential harvesting uh, tactic. So they're given away their password. Um, we do monitor when we're getting attacks from overseas. So if somebody tries to log into an account, it will get blocked if it's from overseas. So that was caught by that and we reset the password as a precaution to that. So so just to clarify then, a staff member responded to one of these sort of scam emails and, and disclosed their password. How did you find out about that? And, and do we have any sort of disciplinary procedures in place to deal with that? Because that's, as I understand it, that's one of the big risks that companies and, and um, government departments and the like hospital boards and so on are exposed to and have caused major hacking problems in the past. So through the chair, um, we have a training program that, that we roll out and that has shown evidence of working and improving it. Um, these phishing campaigns that these companies and that run or personal hackers um, are quite cunning. Um, so it would be unrealistic to expect everyone to be able to pick up everything every time. It's more about an awareness program to get people to be aware and understanding of what they're clicking on and making sure that they are trained in that. So how did you find out? So we have monitoring that detects um, the anomalies, as I said earlier, so we can see when somebody logs in from a place that isn't where we expect, or if they come from overseas, we just automatically block that and we get a trigger alert on that. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you. Um, I just I just wanted to um, ask a question around ransomware. Um, the other day we heard, um, I think it was through one of the workshops. It's a matter of uh, when not. Uh, uh, what's are, are we involved um, as a collective of local government um, and like in our approach to cyber security, or are we kind of on our own, or how, how do we how are we piecing all that together? So we put a lot of focus into our ransomware protection. So the main uh, risk to that is not having good backups. So we ensure that we have good backups that go back and offline backups so they can't be affected. Um, there isn't a, a group of people that are doing it in a standardised approach because that ransomware really does just rely on really good backups. Okay, Thank so that, yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks for that. Um, so if... Uh, so, so basically, we do what daily backups. So that's how you mitigate the response. Um, what we do is we have all of the smartest um, Microsoft technologies in place that look at AI and all of those sort of things to monitor that anomalies again. Um, but that's from a computer perspective. So, if the computer, or the antivirus sees the computer not running quite the way it should. It will pick up on that and alert it. Um, we do have policies in place to lock out computers and things like that along the way. Um, so we are using AI to sort of proactively protect us in that way. Thanks. Thank you for that. Any other comments before we move on? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, look, Scott, just on, on page 33, um, I think we've had information about this before, but maybe some time ago, the reference to your graduates program or graduate pro graduate program, which you've created uh, with an aim to attract and retain graduates um, under the responsibility of the IS team. Um, how's that coming along? Is it implemented yet? Uh, do, can you can you give us a bit more, or can you remind us a little bit about it, please? Through the chair, I'll pass that on to Isabel because that's her graduate program. <laughs> okay, thank you. <clears throat> 
Yeah, so we have um, completed the, the program, the definition for each uh, year. Um, it took a while to be defined because um, it also involves other departments in the in the council. And um, what we are working now is contacting universities. And instead of just uh, sharing this information and asking for uh, expressions of interest, we uh, will also be trying to go to the universities. And um, there is also uh, there is always um, um, activities for the for the uh, the students that are finishing their studies to talk about um, new uh, organizations or new programs and we will try to have um, um, a talk to, to, to the students directly so that's why it's taking a bit longer but we're trying to do it in a way that it will be efficient to reach uh, the target um, students or graduates thank you Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Granado, um, the program runs for three years. Is there a bonding period after that for um, these so, graduates to remain? Yes, yeah, so we will be considering after the, by the end of the first year, uh, to have them moving into a permanent position, because in the team we have one permanent position open. Uh, and we moved into this program exactly because we were not able to fill in the position. We did three campaigns. We've managed to find one person uh, on the last campaign, but this person just stayed three months with us. So we believe that now we have better a better offer to to attract people and to increase their uh, uh, their knowledge on the council and the systems uh, and to to stay in the council. Right. Thank you, uh, Councillor McCone. Yeah, just on page 23, you've got property asset management system. Could we expand on that a wee bit, please, and what it involves and what we're going to end up with? So the property asset management system is um, done for our property team to look after the leases and a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm not 100% sure on. Um, it's run by the projects team at the moment, um, who we don't have represented here. Um, it was... Sitting for a while due to lack of resourcing. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of that. I know previous councils will be. Um, but we do have a project manager assigned to it, so that's getting back on track now and rescoping it and making sure that the scope is all correct. Thank you for that. No other questions? Great. I think that's about it then. Thank you very much. Okay, we have our finance and corporate um, group update. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hope. Uh, yeah, good morning. I'll cover questions on the first three sections, and Mrs. Elga uh, will cover off anything related to the community function. So, yeah, we'll take questions. Any questions? Yeah. Councillor yeah. Hopkins? Just, um, Probably for the benefit of the public as much as any, any anything, but under finance, second bullet point, you talk about resourcing issues on the part of Water New Zealand and how the annual report will only is likely to be adopted in May of this year. That's last year's annual report, isn't it? So audit's actually close to a year behind. Six months or more. That's correct. It's yeah, the, the 22 annual report. Any other questions on that page? Okay, moving on to corporate development. Any any questions there? Page 35. Okay, we might pass it on to Mrs. Alga. Welcome. Thank you. Um, through the chair, I'm happy to take the report as read. I would like to highlight, though, the work that the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs team have been doing. It's actually quite phenomenal, the outcomes that we're getting there. And I've just done a quick um, add up of the number of people we've actually gotten jobs over the lifetime of that project. And it's 126. 
And out of those, the percentage that have not sustained employment is very, very low. So we're really, really proud of that effort and we hope that we're able to continue to do that. Subsequent to the report, we do currently now have 47 people in this, these two tranches and we've only just started tranche two. So our target's 50. So we're on track to exceed that target again. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. I think that's excellent work. What happens if we are oversubscribed with the numbers that we had um, put in? Uh, we, good question. Um, and we have been oversubscribed, but we manage the um, funding in a way that enables us to put as many people in as we can. And often that is more than um, the 50. And we did get um, $10,000 additional funding for sustainable outcomes. So sustainable outcomes are people engaged in employment or apprenticeships for more than 90 days. So we were able to um, secure that additional funding and utilise that for other people as well. So we do have a bit of flexibility within that funding. No, that's very helpful. Can I also ask another question? Um, to Pukinga and the ITOs, do, are you having good interaction or the interface with them and their local employers? Um, I understand the team are. So that'd be the place to answer that mm. than, than myself. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Hopkins. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Look, uh, Helen, I do have a couple. I was going to actually um, congratulate, well, everyone involved with the Mayor's Task Force of Jobs. You've done that, and I absolutely endorse your comments. It's, it really is heartening. Some additional questions. Um, on page 37, there's a reference to the welcoming com com communities delivered through council with the seed funding from the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. Um, how long are they going to provide the seed funding for and what will happen next? Um, I also have a couple of other questions. Do you want me to all at once or one at a time? Okay. Uh, through the chair, um, we have that we have that funding for three years. That funding is for the salary for the welcoming communities coordinator. So the idea is that by the end of that time, we will have a plan, and we would have also worked with our local providers like the Waitaki Multicultural Council to ensure that the host community is working and including being more inclusive of our welcoming communities. Um, Anna is doing some good work. There's some great things happening in that space. So as an example, um, for Race Relations Day, welcoming communities are partnering with the Waitaki Multicultural Council. And on Saturday, they're having a combined um, event at the Marae at Moiraki. So our migrants will learn about our Moiraki community and vice versa. So that's one example of some of the things that are happening. So she's making good progress. And at the end of it, we will have a plan, hopefully within the next 12 months, to bring to council. No, that's great. Also acknowledging Race Relations Day today and the two events that are um, being undertaken today. Thank you very much. Um, Ms Tangaroa is doing a great job organising those and, and just um, supporting the interface with Mana Whenua as well, which is really helpful. Um, what was the uh, next question relates to the Stronger Waitaki Network um, Mental Health um, HUI. Uh, you're saying a report from that is currently being drafted and will be provided to the network. Given that it's under Stronger Waitaki's auspices, will we see that report? Uh, we can make, through the chair, happy to make uh, that available to councillors. It, it's not a public document per se, but is available to those people who took part in the co-design. So uh, this is a really important piece of work and is going to be quite transformational for us, we believe. So definitely happy to provide something to those councillors who have an interest in that area. Thank you. Um, final two questions. Um, the Hine Ora Warrior Princess Workshop successfully delivered to 16 year seven and eight students who identified as female. Is there any similar workshop for seven and eight year students who identify as male? Through the chair, I'm not aware this particular program was targeted at girls. So that is why we have 
this particular program in our schools was really to build that resilience and confidence in our young women. My last question is um, on the senior survey. Um, this is a reference there on the bullet point, 2022, you had a total of 30, 355 respondents who completed the survey, which is a very small percentage of the total number of people over the age, say, of 65 in Oamaru and Waitaki. Um, I'm concerned, especially if they're self-selecting, that, that, may, that, that, that the results of that survey may disproportionately influence our decisions based on a very, very small um, sample base. Do you, do you have a view on that? Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to me to be enough people to draw conclusions. Through the chair, um, that's quite comparative with the number of people who completed our last senior survey, which was five years ago, which I think was 420 or something. Um, this piece of research is one piece of research amongst other research that we will be looking at to make informed decisions. So it's it's not a standalone thing. Uh, the reason that we did this is that we wanted a comparative to the previous research that we'd done. And that's the primary, primary reason that we did that. So it will be one element of a number of elements to inform our decisions. And I think it provides some good foundation information as well as the qualitative information and the findings that will come from that. Um, and those issues appear to be around transport, mobility, uh, signs of isolation, which has been a huge issue, uh, and also the cost of living, which we're aware of, which is getting harder and harder. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Ryan. I Thank you, through the Chair. Um, I was just interested, what services do we have at the moment for um, children and, and young people um, who need support for mental health and other addictions. Do we have any statistics as well? Are there wait lists or any? Yeah. We have significant number of services for mental health and addictions, mm -hmm. and part of the work that we've been doing is doing a stop take. What we often don't have is capacity within those services. So one of the key issues in this area in particular, but also in health and social services in general, is workforce. So there is, there is limited funding and limited workforce in order to deliver the services. And post-COVID, the needs of our young people and our tamariki are significantly more. What we're seeing is a lot more, um, not just demand for services, but complexity of need. So there's a lot going on in that space. And there's also, though, I would have to say a lot of work, particularly in this community, to look at how we can coordinate things and address things holistically so that any door is the right door and improve the accessibility and the capacity of services to be able to deliver and to support our schools because our schools are really bearing the brunt of this. Yeah, no, thank you. We do have a huge shortage of uh, frontline community practitioners and social workers. Uh, the wait list for um, counselling services is increasing, and also the complexity that schools are, are facing, uh, especially principals uh, with behavioural issues um, that do need that wraparound support. So it is something that's top of mind um, in terms of um, this piece of work. Yes. Through the chair, I would just like to say that we're doing quite significant work on a child, youth and whānau mental health and wellbeing strategy. And that strategy, will it has already provided quite comprehensive data. So we've done quite a bit of research, local research into that. And all stakeholders have contributed. I think in terms of our youth, we had um, between intermediate age and high school age, over 200 young people contributed to that research. So we've captured their voices as well. What we're doing now is collating that research and um, formatting and then we our strategy, and then we will do um, another consultation process with the people that have contributed to that. And that will not only give us a pathway forward, but it will give us the evidence we need for increased funding and investment in this community. Thank you. Another question? Maybe just oh, slightly related to um, to those stats, but also just um, under sort of census 2023. Do we, I know there's um, the stats nationally for how many people have filled out the census. Do we get that feedback 
locally at all and, and is there any work going on to I guess finish everyone across the board? Yes, we have been, oh sorry, we have been working with um, Area Manager Tanya McFarlane from um, Census 2023 team and uh, we have been working with um, our Pacific community in particular that has been an emphasis uh, for Waitaki and we do have a meeting schedule for this Thursday to get preliminary um, results. I understand that they are probably above, you know, like the rest of the South Island at this stage, but I know that there's still a lot of work to do to help support our community to complete that survey. So, yeah, I think we're tracking along okay, but we still need a lot of, um, of work to be done. Not very, not very well mm. Any other questions from the South Island? I think that might be about it. Thank you very sorry, much. Oh, sorry. Just, just following up on the mental health question and with respect to uh, availability of workforce, is, is that, uh, that that's obviously a national issue? We're, we're not having trouble specifically in attracting skills to Waimaru. Through the chair, no, you're quite right. Um, it is a national issue. However, um, we are focusing on what we can do at a local level to not just attract staff, but to actually develop staff locally. So that like, there are some um, interventions that can be done that like with train the trainer. So if we can bring people in from the outside to train our local people to deliver, then that's what we're trying to do. We're looking at all sorts of different options. This is a long-term issue. It's not going to be a quick fix. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Um, if I may answer that, Madam Chair, um, there has been a, a fault in the heating unit that's been discovered by the property unit. They are working on it. They've got the contractor coming. So um, we do apologise, but the heating was turned on this morning. It just did not work. Thank you. You could do that in the morning tea break. <laughs> okay, move on to um, Heritage Environment and Regulatory Group update. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in good tradition, the uh, Her Group report will do its best to warm you all up. <laughs> <laughs> bit, um, bit thin on the ground with um, officers today. One's enjoying the, um, the beautiful weather out there at the landfill remediation um, sites um, in the field. And another one is actually attending the civil defence multi-agency briefing on the weather. And we have Andrew. David Campbell. Andrew. Andrew. Um, we have Andrew on the line as well. So um, happy to take the report as read. And uh, between us, we'll do our best to answer the questions. Otherwise, we'll take them away and get the answers. Okay. Answer number 10. Just Roger, um, resource consent monitoring, what exactly is involved in that, please? Uh, so this is when um, our um, compliance monitoring and enforcement team um, sample consents um, and go and can check that they've been compliant to the conditions on those resource consents. Thank you, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for the report, Mr Cook. Um, I, I suppose uh, it may be too early to tell, but if you look at the resource consents and I'm notified October 33, November 22, December 16, food registrations also heading south, 17, 16, 2, um, land information memorandums. Is, is, it, is that just seasonal or, do you, or is it beginning? Uh, we are hearing about the slowdown and, and, and the GDP lack of growth at our etc and the um, technical recession and so forth are these stats very small clues that that may in fact be coming to pass uh, thank you through the chair um yes i think these stats are indicative that we may be um seeing a slow up in the economy um, around the areas that we um, monitor measure and consent uh, certainly, January and February's um, data for building consents and um, et cetera 
were significantly lower um, and we were um, not out of line. Um, the rest of the consenting authorities in the Otago group um, have also seen a significant decline in building consent applications. However, in the last um, couple of weeks, we've um, seen an uplift. So um, it's very difficult to tell, but um, the general trend is down at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Welcome, Mr. Campbell. Um, just in terms of page 43, um, just key risks in terms of the district plan update. How are we addressing these? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the resourcing one is probably the key one, and with a fairly small team, we have got to outsource some of the specialist work. So we have already landscape architects doing work on the, the mapping feedback, which is significant. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we've also um, outsourced some of the specific planning work where we've needed help. So we haven't blanketly given it all out to consultants. We've worked out what we need help with, we can deal with internally, and we've got some small sort of contracts helping us out with consultants that we've used before and have a good track record with us. So um, that'll be for the next period of work leading up to the um, adoption of the proposed plan later this year. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, um, well, um, this is relates to the waste the information we have uh, on page 45. Um, two questions, the waste management and minimisation plan. A review is underway. Plan is a guiding document for solid waste and waste minimisation. Being managed by Council's Waste Minimisation Office, Lucy Ann White, with assistance from Unomia Consulting. Well, um, sorry, I don't think we've, do we have a cost for that? And, and um, why are we bringing consultants in for a review of the WMMP when I think previously it's been done in house? If I could come in there. Um, so we've been working across Otago uh, between the councils uh, to look at uh, waste and how we might uh, do things better together uh, as a means of, you know, uh, dealing with some of the uh, you know, challenges around waste and potentially, you know, saving on cost. Uh, you know, we are consulting uh, or commissioned by, jointly by uh, the local authorities uh, to do that work. Uh, and therefore, given their you know, knowledge of where Otago is at, it was suggested that they uh, continue to work uh, with the local authorities, including Waitaki, in looking at the, uh, you know, the development of a joint waste minimisation plan for Otago. Uh, so it's about us joining up uh, with others and doing it jointly together. I'm surprised, perhaps you or Mr Hope could tell us, I don't think we've seen a line item in the budgets. There's, I presume if we've got these consultants as a cost, um, do we know what it is for us? Will that be part of the generic consulting budget that we have? Uh, I think it's contained within the cost of the waste minimisation plan. It forms part of that work uh, rather than a line item on its own. Um, thank you. Look, my other question on the same page um, is a reference to the very successful and popular Enviro Schools programme. I thought in one of the annual plan documents we had that we were looking at more funding or were another person for that program. And yet when I went back, I couldn't find the particular line item again. Are we actually um, uh, addition, providing additional funding for environment, Enviro schools and are we employing more people? Or helping to pay for more people? Thank you, Mr. Cook. Through the chair, uh, the answer is yes. We are providing more funding and we are about to go to market to recruit for an, another person. That is paid for through the waste levy rebates that we receive. So there is a line item in the annual plan to allow for the increase in the FTE, but there's no actual increase in cost in them. So, so to clarify, we may be employing additional person, but it's not being funded, but it's essentially it's coming from a central government source, not from us. Okay, 
I, I would still argue that this is a, a sense we are we should not be involved in education, in my view, unless we um, get directly some ability to influence curriculum and, and, and character of schools. It's a it's a central government activity, and they spend sixteen million and can't actually manage create people produce kids who can read or write um, or add up. <laughs> so I'm not entirely sure why we should be spending money, although in this instance we're not. So I'm relieved to hear that. I think that's only your view, and I think when we look at our mission around empowering our people and our place to thrive, these are some of the important outcomes that we have actually agreed on in terms of our strategic priorities. Um, so you're going to make a comment, Mr Cook? Yeah, thank you. Through the Chair, um, I don't know whether the um, elected members have had the chance, but I would really encourage you to click on those two YouTube links in the report. Um, they really illustrate that um, the, the benefit of the program that it has on individuals and young people um, and goes way beyond just the simple um, education per se, the, the links um, and the effect that it's had on those two people um, and uh, is, is quite remarkable. So I do encourage you to click on those links. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Councillor McCone, you have a question? Uh, yeah, just to go back to page 43, yeah, yeah, he's completed in progress and everything else. Do you have closer timelines like months or of when, when uh, lots of priorities and, and when are we going to get that feedback? Uh, thank you. We have a um, schedule of, of workshops ahead. Um, I think the next one is in May, I think off the top of my head. Um, and they run through to about October. Um, and then uh, we will prepare the draft plan for final approval in the meeting at Christmas, December. There is a considerable amount of work still being done by the team to um, get those chapters um, aligned with the feedback. Um, and there's a, there will be a lot of reading for councillors um, over the coming months in relation to the district plan chapters. Thank you very much. Councillor Ryan, you have a question? Thank you, for it, Chair. Just interested in the launch of a separate Waistery Waitaki Facebook page um, to feature updates, workshops, etc. Is that will, will the council still be pushing that through other channels? I, I just wonder whether that will attract people who are interested in waste minimisation, but it's good to kind of reach that broader audience um, as well. Thank you. I don't have the, um, the the full details of the engagement plan, but that's certainly um, something we'll take on board. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's a good question to make sure that we broaden our reach as much as possible. Uh, any other questions or comments? Thank you. I think that might be about it. Thank you very much, Mr. Cook and Mr. Campbell. All right, we move on to our economic development update. Who can I pass that on to? Uh, I was expecting Mel to be joining us in the chamber, but uh, she's not here. Uh, I'll take it as read. Happy to answer any questions that I can. Okay. Warm welcome. <laughs> so we're just up to our economic development um, update, um, Mrs. Jones, and um, yeah, just inviting any feedback or questions from the governance group if they have in regards to the report. Uh, yes, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for the report. There's an awful lot of very helpful information and um, some of it a bit concerning about the various sectors, including dairying and farming and the like. But a couple of questions I have. Um, on page 47, you talk about the recruitment of the placemaking lead role is, is progressing and you hope that, that you can appoint in the next few weeks. I was just wondering if there's any update on that. 
Now, and whether we are closer to having a, a preferred candidate or even have appointed somebody. The other question I had on the next page, you're looking at new ways of working. This is under the heading of, this is under, well, first, first couple of paragraphs, looking at ways to explore delivery of the WED strategy outcomes. There's going to be a WED forum in April bringing together members of the Tour Waitaki Tourism Association Advisory Group and Stronger Waitaki ED. Are councillors able to participate or will we be involved in that in any way? Kia ora. Thanks for your questions, uh, Councillor Hopkins. Uh, to answer the first one on placemaking, we interviewed three people last week, um, one of whom was out of district, um, and there's one other person we'll be interviewing this week, and then we'll be able to um, move forward to the next steps. So we're hoping um, we've got a couple of the candidates are out of town, so it might take them a short while to relocate here, um, but we are making good progress and we've had some high quality um, candidates putting their names forward. Um, May I ask a question? Yes. What are, what are the? I mean, perhaps this might be drilling down a wee bit, but it's a, it sounds esoteric. What are the sort of skill sets and um, attributes? Uh, are they are, do they involve urban design, planning, architecture? Um, what what what, are, what sort of skill set are we looking for from this person? Primarily, we're looking at people with economic development experience and within the field of placemaking. So with some awareness of planning and planning reg regulations and spatial spatial planning. Um, a couple of the candidates that we've had that we've interviewed have extensive um, experience in that area. Um, but equally, we, we want people who ha have good project management skills because it's going to be important that we manage projects um, efficiently and effectively and on, on budget. Um, so, th so that's another element. But equally, that we need them to be able to collaborate and network really effectively with the, with the business community and with the community generally. So there's a, not, there's a raft of skills and experience that, that, we're, that we're looking to fill. And um, from the ED forum um, perspective, I'm, I'm glad you've picked up on that. That is looking at an opportunity and um, working with the current business groups to say, is there a way we can work to, together differently to improve the outcomes that we're trying to deliver in the economic development strategy? So we recognize that there's a number of business groups out there, the Waitaki Tourism Association, the advisory group that's part of Business South, uh, Stronger Waitaki has an economic development arm too, and there's a number of in individuals, and we're all kind of working in the same space. So this is an opportunity to bring the groups together and say, here are the outcomes we're looking to deliver through the economic development strategy. Is there a way that we can collaborate and use our assets more effectively to deliver the outcomes that we, we all want to see for the district? Uh, so that session, we're looking at quite a tight group because it, it, at the moment it's it's primarily targeting the people who sit around those monthly, they tend to meet monthly or quarterly, uh, sit around the table and say, well, can you en envisage a different way of working and how might we do that together? So at the moment we weren't extending it um, to broader, broader than that. Uh, but clearly, well, I'll be reporting and where we get to with that and there'll, there'll be ongoing um, interactions um, thereafter and so we'll, we'll bring it back to the council table but it's it's more let's have a small group to say well how are we all working what what are we all trying to achieve individually and collectively and and coming up with some new models so quite an exciting opportunity thank and you. certainly the, the business groups who are involved are quite um open to the open to that thank you thank you for that any other uh, questions Actually, I, I do have one more, a bit further down on page 50. Um, are you able to tell us, under the, at the very bottom of the page, we've got residential and non-residential cons um, consents. And you say that the non-residential consents here remain solid, with nearly 21.8 million issued in the year to debt 22, up 36%, etc., which is certainly... Um, significantly greater than the 17.3% for Otago generally and 13.1% in New Zealand. What type of non-residential consents are we getting, do you know? I mean, are you able, have you, can, does the data tell us that? Um, I haven't got that level of, 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 of information. Um, and actually, I had exactly that thought this morning. And as I, when I was reading it again, I haven't, yeah, that, that information isn't available, but I'm sure we can ask the planning team um, to um, uh, update us on that. 
but it's um, certainly on the non-residential consents, it's, it's very positive relative to, to New Zealand Inc. Yeah. Thank you for that. Any other comments? Just moving through the report. We'll be very quiet this morning. I, I can quickly update, because um, I mentioned it in, in last month's report, um, Thor, um, a pilot episode of a new drama series has now taken place and they're in post-production and it will be um, being coming on to TV screens in the not too distant future, sponsored or, or endorsed by Waitaki District Council. So that's a, a, nice, <laughs> a nice move, but they're very excited that the pilot's going to lead to ongoing episodes. Oh, that's great. Uh, Councillor Coles online, you have a question? And then Councillor Percival after. Yeah, hi, look, I was just looking at the, um, at the section there on page 50, our visitor economy, and I see that, you know, um, compared to Otago and I guess the rest of New Zealand, we're, we're sitting relatively low there with that, with that tourism expenditure. Is there any particular reason for that, why we sort of sit, sit in that area? Um, and is that is that over our entire region? I I know you have a, a further update with the tourism um, Waitaki team later on today. Um, I, I think what we're seeing is growing momentum and appreciation that Waitaki has a lot to offer and has some has a has a, a growing selection of um, eateries and new businesses coming into town and 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 visitors are are finding it more engaging um i i haven't got into the detail but certainly the top end outlets i know <clears throat> talking to uh, the luxury lodge owner penny Brin at the weekend he is fully booked for months to come and has been doing exceptionally well um as are some of the other top end um on a higher value attractions elsewhere in the district so i think certainly that is all all it's all the little pieces are adding up to to create some a very strong um uh, visitor economy um uh, even though it's still quite small um it, it's certainly heading in the right right direction and good to see the international visitors coming back which i know is helping the the penguin colony which we'll talk to later thank you thank you for that councillor percival you had a comment yeah no, i'd like to know what it's all costing us and a total of all the funding that you're receiving from outside sources, including ours, I'd like to see what it's costing us for staff, for all the resources that you're actually putting into place here with the ED and tourism. It's not an unfair question because we are responsible for what happens with that funding. But if you put it all together, I'd like to know what the total is and how much is external, how much is here, what you're taking your whole for payroll, the whole nine yards, which I don't think I've ever seen. You're talking about the um, staff expenditure? I'm talking about overall costs, I just said. All your funding from the outside internally and what's costing us. And again, it's obviously benefits, but I think it also needs to see where it's all going. That's all I want to know. Yep. I mean, I think I think we we mentioned in the report we have obviously received monies from Better Off Fund, and that is that is resourcing the two new roles that we've just received. But we can, yep, we can provide a summary. Any other questions? Well, presumably if I can announce to the guys at some point on that, I can understand why it wouldn't necessarily be able to have it now, but it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. I did just I had a much more precise and particular question about costs finally on page 55. You're talking about there's a reference to neat places, which I understand is essentially an advertorial video campaign. And um I see where I know we've discussed it in the past. I thought Tourism Waitaki was a funding source, but this report says we're funding a new Neat Places video. Filming's taking place and the video will be launched after Easter. 
what's the total? Am, was, am I right? Was it us or TW paying for this, along with the people who appear in the videos, as I understand it? And what is the cost to date of the new video, new Neat Places video program to us, if indeed it is us that's been paying the bills? The, you're right, Tourism Waitaki has paid for the, the printing of the brochures um, and the social media campaign, which I, from memory was about 22,000, I believe. And we're paying for the video, which is 8,000. So there's a new video being produced at the moment. It's been shot now, it's just being finalized. It will also include um, some more highlights around the Geo Park, um, Moraki Boulders, Elephant Rocks, Campbell's Bay. Um, and um, and it will be part of the promotional campaign for for the neat places businesses. And certainly, talking to one of the neat places businesses at the weekend, he said business has been fantastic, and he can't believe the number of people who are coming into the shop, having seen the on on the back of having the, the neat places brochure. So so it's clearly it's working well. And I, I did put in the link to um, the food um, it's because it's a whole social media campaign as well. It's not just the brochure. And the last food one was lovely because it didn't just talk about businesses in the brochure. It actually talked about a number of other businesses and people who are looking after the soil, like Jim Gorman was profiled as somebody who's looking after the soil and Mean Greens up the road. So and I know they've been pushing it out on their social media and it's been picked up on on the, the um, broader social media sites as well. So uh, it's a very strong holistic campaign that works well against the target that it's, um, the people that it's targeting. So just to clarify things, so the, the cost of video production is $8,000. The, the report says we're funding a new video, uh, Neat Places video. So is it, is it now 8,000 plus? No, that, that, is, is, that, is, that is the 8,000. So we did one last year, which is on currently on the website. Um, but the, the new one is, is a refreshed one to, to, to um, incorporate the new businesses that are in there and new sites across the district. Thank you. And it will be branded up with the Geopark logo on it once we have the official um, endorsement. Thank you for that. I have Councillor Ryan and then Councillor Thompson and Holding. Thank you for the chair. I, I just would like to say that I think the Neat Places campaign is, is wonderful. Um, and if the new video is anything like the last video, um, I know that went really well and people are really proud to share it. It's top quality video production and it's something that yeah, a lot of residents are really proud to, to share and show off our district. Um, I was just going back to the visitor economy stats. I was just wondering, how, do, how does Waitaki usually compare to Otago in nationally? Um, like I guess growing by 10%, but um, compared with a 24.4% increase in Otago and 18.9% nationally, how do we usually compare to those other regions in terms of growth? We are a very small region from a visitor perspective, but it's less than 3% of total GDP. So it is tiny. So we have always historically had, had strong growth rates. But the good thing is we're seeing it con consistently move up and grow over time. Otago um, always, of course, people come to the South Island during the summer period. So you would expect Otago to be having strong growth too. And I suppose we're seeing the rebound around the rest of the country as international visitors come in. So we're still in a bit of flux relative to historic trends, uh, but we have been tracking tracking well. Um, the team, here, you know, the, with the, the interim team here, they're doing a good job um, and um, getting some sort of good promotional activity out there. Thank you for that. Councillor Thompson, you had a comment or a question? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Look, I, I, I'm trying to, to, to phrase um, my observation in a positive term um, because I accept that if I was involved in the tourism industry, um, I'd be absolutely chuffed that we're out there supporting them. But at the end of the day, we're talking about a sector that's 3% of our GDP, um, and we've got other sectors vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, the primary sector and, and then the secondary production businesses that are banked off that. Um, have we anything in the pipeline that we're going to assist or promote these industries? Because a 10% a increase in primary uh, sector equates to... Um, the tourism sector having to double its um, growth. Oh. 
Yeah, that's a very fair point, Councillor Thompson. Um, we are uh, working on exploring some new opportunities, which is part of the business and enterprise growth leads role. Um, we did, for example, have a discussion last week with MPI around an on-farm support programme. Um, they do have some money to help um, pilot some new um, activation here and are very keen to work with us. So we're, we're just exploring opportunities um, on, on that point. Um, there is um, other work that we're looking at in the business innovation area too, but nothing tangible yet. Um, but I will be updating as when we have something more tangible, I'll be, I'll be bringing it to the table. But we, at the moment, we're just exploring opportunities. The area that we are making good progress on or are looking at some interesting opportunities is around the whole skill build and people area, because we recognize that's a long term play and, and we want to start working on it. And we specifically had a had a good conversation, Stronger by Taki, uh, the RSLG and, and, and ourselves around Pacifica and Maori opportunities. And there's a couple of opportunities that we'll be bringing to the Pacifica community and, and Maori com uh, community in, in, the, in the coming weeks. Um, I know Andy's going to be reaching out directly. So um, it's there's not a lot to talk about at this stage, but, but be assured we are uh, working in the background to explore what the opportunities are. And opportunities. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Just noted on page 54, the Whitestone Waitaki Geopark. Um, yeah, just acknowledging um, the accreditation um, and that's going to be endorsed um, at the end of May, which is a, which is a huge um, piece of work that's been undertaken over the last few years. Well done. No other questions? All right, I think that might be about it. Thank you very much. Oh, I have one from you. Yeah, we'll move, we will move into the communications update. Everyone. Thank you, Sonia. So we have the report in front of us. And any questions? Councillor Hopkins? Yeah, well, actually, I do have a couple. Um, Sonia, um, at the bottom of page 56, um, News of Omari being voted as number two on the worldatlas.com for the most beautiful small town, unfairly pipped at the post by Queenstown. Now, question number one, how on earth did they unfairly pip us at the post? Question number two, should we declare war on them? <laughs> and the other question, <laughs> on page 58, we set up and launch of the Let's Talk Waitaki Engagement HQ. Yes. Can we please have a bit more information yes. about um, what seems like an extraordinarily extravagant mirrored glass tower block <laughs> high-rise indulgence. Um, yep, um, so question number two, yes, we should, um, which was declare war on Queenstown. Um, the first one was just a bit of editorial on my part. <laughs> um, I'm sure it was fair. <laughs> um, so the Let's Talk Waitaki Engagement HQ is an online engagement platform that we have been talking about for a while, it was originally called Bang the Table. Um, so it's something that's going to be, <laughs> it's not a physical building, it's just something that's going to be replacing, at the moment we're using SurveyMonkey and we're having a few problems with that. It's not um, okay. ideal. So this is more um, uh, one place where people can come and engage with us. So there's things like public forums, um, quick polls, um, surveys, and you can also do your um, formal submissions through that. So that's something that we've just um, signed up for and we'll be replacing, phasing out SurveyMonkey. Um, so we just need to set that up so that it um, is set up in a way that's ready for, so we haven't quite gotten ready for the annual plan, unfortunately, but we'll um, our next big engagements will be going on through there and we'll definitely be sending out more information about how that works and, and getting everyone on board before we launch that. Thank you. I'm pleased to hear that we've I've had grave anxieties about that bang the table. Um, the difficulty with that is that people had, were banging the table, for instance, last year, very vehemently, 900 of them, yes. and we took no notice at all. So it struck me as a very bad piece of marketing. Um, let's talk by tacky. Maybe we could just use it up a bit, but um, yeah, it's certainly better than bang the table. Thank you. And I'm right. relieved to hear that there's no tower block or mirror glass involved. Oh, Councillor Ryan, you were... Thank you, thank you. Just um, last year, I remember there was some discussion over um, consultation fatigue 
um, I guess, with the annual plan and uh, Forest of Heights at the same time, with the annual plan and then the Economic Development Agency consultation. I mean, I guess what was learned? Is there anything that was learned last year to kind of to avoid that consultation fatigue again this year? Um, I mean, it would be nice not to have multiple things going at once, but these things are at least are related. So I don't think we're going to have that um, shift of focus onto Forrester Heights that we did last time. Um, and we're kind of wrapping it all up into one consultation, or the annual plan and ED, um, lots of related topics. Again, there's not probably anything that's really, um, I don't know, I might be wrong, but controversial or that's, you know, really engaging about this year's annual plan. So we're just relying on people being interested in the topics and giving us feedback. Um, hopefully this new engagement HQ will bring a fresh kind of um, lift to our consultation. It's a lot more fun and there's multiple ways that people can engage rather than through this one survey format. So this time round, um, probably not going to go really hard on engagement. We don't want to overload people. Um, so just going to stick to the um, social media promotion and a few bit of advertising on radio and um, newspaper. Um, I guess it doesn't feel like it's such a high-pressure environment. We don't have the voting going on at the same time. Um, and like Forrester Heights was quite a big one for us. So hopefully people will have had a little time to rest and recuperate and be wanting to speak to us again. Thank you. Any other comments? I think that might be up for you, Sonia. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome, Mr. Nelson, with our health and safety update. Uh, I'd like to take the report as read and ask if there are any questions. Uh, Councillor Pesava? Yeah, Bill, we share you with the hospital. We don't get any figures on the hospital at all. Obviously, we don't. Uh, Not included in, in any of these stats, are they? No, no. No, they'll, they'll be reporting their health and safety as part of their report to council. Oh, <laughs> okay. Thanks, Bill. Uh, just for a point of clarity, um, council, first of all, through the chair, um, a couple of years ago, we appointed someone to do three days a week health and safety over at the hospital. So I'm now full full time here. Mm. Thank you for that. Councillor Hopkins, you have a question followed by Councillor Blackler. Oh, um, yeah, well, I've got two actually. Um, on page 60, Bill, you talk about <clears throat> at the bottom a worker engagement and participation audit, audit mm. making plans for the roading and water services teams. Yes. I'm curious to know if there's a cost associated with that and if so, what it is. And the other question I had on page 62 under notes, accident and incident report, the low number of reported injuries year to date <clears throat> reflects a trend of under-reporting that has been improving over the last quarter. Is it possible that it actually reflects a trend that we're actually getting better at being uh, safer and careful? I mean, surely under-reporting is not the only explanation for the low number of reported injuries. Um, uh, I'll... Through the chair, I'll speak to the worker engagement participation audit. This is an internal audit. Um, we're trying to get better engagement across our team. So it runs very much like a financial audit where we have an initial meeting. We sit down, we discuss with the whole team what their health and safety related issues are. We prioritise, we set up an audit programme. I go away and do it. I bring back the findings, they decide the recommendations, I hand over the audit, they work their recommendations through. So there's no extra cost associated with that. Um, and I, I am tending to agree with your comment, um, Councillor Hopkins, about 
the underreporting. It is less of an issue now, and it is indeed more reflective of the uh, benefit of the training we've given our staff, the better um, supervision of works, and acting very quickly on incidents as they come up. So, for example, the um, the Otamatada domain and watering, and watering was um, going onto the path, and a person fell over as a consequence. So we had a quick discussion with the contractor and decided they had to be a bit more careful about where their water was aiming. Similar thing in A2O with um, irrigators. So things are being acted on a lot more quickly. There's a better relationship, I feel, between contractors and council staff in terms of their understanding of the importance of health and safety. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Blackwell. Thank you. Um, I just had two, two questions. The first one was, I was wondering if you could elaborate further on the um, confined space. Um, probably that was a net, classified as a near miss. And secondly, on the um, topic of near misses, um, you know, the, the evidence suggests that a, a large number of near misses occur prior to an incident actually occurring. So it's interesting to note that uh, near miss reporting is very low compared with the actual incidents that are mm -hmm. occurring. So do, do you see that as a potential issue? What was the first question again, sorry? I just want just wanted to you to just elaborate on the confined space. Oh, um, right. So the confined space incident was to do with a entry to a tank over at the pool. Uh, there was some DE. Uh, I'm not going to explain it. Uh, something or other earth product that they use, and the contractor came on board without a proper plan. Uh, has qualification to do the work had expired. Our pool manager picked up on that, stopped the work, got the principal around, they got um, support so that they could get up to speed and it was monitored by the person that was qualified to give them that support and it gave a, a polite warning shot across the bowels because this is actually someone that has given council staff grief in the past about health and safety matters. So um, we didn't rub it in. We just took the approach that they're an extension of our team. We've got responsibility to them, um, not only through the act, but also morally. And um, obviously, from our point of view, we want all jobs done safely and people got lives outside of work. So that's, that's clarifying that point. And... I'm sorry, I'm having a blank here for the second question. That's but... okay. I, I just just the near miss reporting as, oh, a, right. as a broader picture. Is it an issue that we don't see much reporting in that space at all when the evidence in the health and safety world suggests that a number yeah. of near misses have yeah. to occur before an actual event does right. occur? So we have staff enter all incidents, including near misses and their health and safety software. A lot of them do put down near miss as one of the categories. Um, but when I look at the information, uh, the description of the incident, they, they are an actual incident. So I'm reclassifying a lot of those. So I then go back to the staff and it's a continuing education thing just to point out what's what. I'd rather they put it down as a near miss and educate or be educated myself. So yeah, they are actually recording a lot of them like that, okay? That's helpful to be aware of. Um, and it's really good that um, you're maintaining the pre-job start meetings as well, just to yes. kind of oversee and monitor the governance of yes. you know, health and safety using our policies and our procedures, which mm. is very good and to help mitigate that risk. Yes. Mm. Uh, any other questions or comments? I, think. I do have one slightly frivolous one, no, only slightly frivolous. 
under the hazard risk register on page 61, you, you've got a sentence here talking about workload management, fatigue and workplace stress remain in focus as key risk areas. Do you include us poor councillors suddenly confronted with um, agendas a length of war and peace and more with two, two days only to actually go through them? Do you include us in your considerations of fatigue and workplace stress? Uh, through the chair, yes. <laughs> And uh, quite seriously, I appreciate the workload that you do have and uh, the short time frames you have to work within. So you are top of mind in that regard, and there are um, options being looked at to support you if necessary. They're in the preliminary stages, fact-finding, but we do want to make sure that you're looked after as well. <laughs> There, that is ex, that's accessible for um, the governance team as well, if they wish, and they can just liaise directly with the mayor or uh, our CEO. Mm -hmm. So the pastoral uh, and mental health and wellbeing support is available to mm -hmm. everybody. We're, we're currently working with OCP, mm -hmm. but um, there are some higher level um, opportunities available to governance teams, so we will be looking at those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nelson. Um, I you. think that brings us to a close for that. So thank you for your report. Yes. Thanks. And I think that's about all for our activities updating from everybody. Thank you very much um, to all the staff that have prepared all of this. And thank you to uh, the governance team for uh, your questions. And we can see that there is um, some helpful questions and some that might be reflecting um, some additional reporting or just the style of the reporting that we might just um, talk about down the track. So thank you. And thank you to um, Councillor Coles as well online. Hopefully your community is all good up there, um, up the valley as well with this weather that's happening. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, it was a bit of a rough night last night, but it's looking okay. So. Um, yeah, we'll get out shortly on a break and we look around, but yeah, pretty resilient, I think. Thank you. Take care. And I think that brings us to a close. And thank you to everybody.